As part of its Global Female Forward campaign, the Friedrich Norman Foundation for Freedom is hosting two podcasts where we will look at women in politics and women in business. It was described to be the female revolution, where women not only were pushed to the forefront, but they also started to fight the fight in their homes, encouraging their families to participate in the protests and in the political life. But this was not the first time Lebanese women have taken the lead. Years ago, they started leading in demanding change in the country for better rights for all Lebanese. Today, we meet with two women, both experts in their respective political fields, to discuss the challenges and hardships that they had to go through years on. For our women in politics, I am very happy to introduce two ladies that inspire me personally today in this panel. We have Carmen Jaha, who's an activist and associate professor of public administration, leadership and organization development at AUB and founder of Khadit Beirut. She is also a research associate at the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership for Women, a regional reference for redying gender inclusive employers across the Arab MENA region. And I am also very happy to introduce today Paula Yaoubian, who's a Lebanese political activist and lawmaker, who was known as a journalist and as a TV host. She became one of Lebanon's most prominent TV personalities. In 2018, she successfully campaigned for a seat in the Lebanese parliament, and she won it, representing the Beirut 1 district, until she recently resigned in protest right after the Beirut blast. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me today. And I am very excited to dive into this rich conversation with you. I want to first start um, with Paula by asking you if you remember the moment when you decided that you want to actually work in politics, like this big moment in your life. Can you tell us a bit about it? It all started in 2015. I've been thinking about what we can do to change the scene in Lebanon. But in 2015, with the garbage crisis, I, I felt my human dignity was, was hurt. Uh, I think every Lebanese remembers the, the smell, remembers the roads, how it was filled with, filled with garbage because of this political caste and because of their inefficiency. So uh, it was back then that I thought that I have to, to change course, to think of something different. Being a journalist in this country is not enough because they don't listen to you. Whatever, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, People stopped listening to, uh, to to journalists, especially. And then uh, in 2016, um, Beirut Madinati and Baalbek Madinati was a turning point for too many Lebanese because we saw that there is there is a different uh, uh, movement, uh, and for the first time, um, a grassroots movement uh, was uh, taking the lead. And people were seeing them and endorsing them from different uh, wakes of, of life. And uh, for me, it was very important to to uh, to watch what they will do in a country sectarian like Lebanon, where in a country where for for decades the same political parties had uh, all the the platform and they they had all the political scene. So. Uh, I watched Beirut Madinati very closely and I've seen the result they've done. And for the first time, I felt there is a movement of brave people standing against all the corrupt junta. And I was thinking since then that, uh, I mean, how can we all support how this movement is going to evolve? Uh, in 2017, I started talking to uh, some uh, um, political groups uh, they approached me, uh, telling me that uh, we hear what you say, uh, even on future TV. Like, we feel that uh, you are really, uh, you want to see change in this country. And I told them, I, I believe that uh, change should is, is the only solution. I mean, staying with the same political parties is, uh, is a certain death for Lebanon. So this is why I, uh, I joined them. I didn't ask much, much questions. I joined them because I thought this is the only way to move forward. A non-sectarian uh, base of people who were never in power 
and who uh, who really wants to do the interest of all the Lebanese. So it was an opportunity for me. I knew that, uh, well, at, back then we had no chances of uh, winning any seats, but I felt that something is brewing, people are changing, and that we have the opportunity to uh, have our first uh, step into the world of a real opposition in this country and not just the same, you know, families, the same uh, mafia, uh, changing, exchanging roles and exchanging uh, benefits uh, between each other. So uh, I felt I want to join and I want to be part of it, even though we had no possibility to win. And I had a lot of uh, other parties asking me to join them, to join them at least in the election. And they told me, you can stay independent. Just join us in our list because you have no chance. They called the that movement that I called the movement of the brave. They called us the Kuluna Watani list. Vote inutile. I don't know how you say it in English. Um, useless. Useless. Yeah. Like you're wasting your, your, your vote when you vote for them because they have no chance of getting even the, the threshold. Uh, I think we proved them wrong in 2018. But my, uh, I think 2022 will prove them even <laughs> much more. I mean, uh, they have to know that there's a different Lebanon, that there's a different youth. And this youth is going forward. They will not look back into their archaic uh, policies. I want to, I want to, before I move to Carmen with this, I was very intrigued when, um, when you said that as a journalist, it wasn't enough because I'm a journalist and I think the same. And I want to move with the activism question to you. But I think it's very important to touch base on what you said, Paula, that they wanted you to run with them. And we're going to talk about this a bit later because did they want you to run with them because you're a woman or because you know because of the gender but but we're going to touch base on that uh, a bit later but I was very moved by this because today we are talking about women in politics and it's important to actually understand what motivates women to go into politics and specifically in Lebanon so I'm going to go back to you but first I want to ask Carmen about activism being an activist myself and a journalist um, the tough question that we all face, people often say that activism should be separated from any career. If you're an activist, you should just remain an activist and your career should be set aside. So what's your opinion um, on this? You know, you being a, pol a policy expert, a university expert and professor, but also an activist. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I am honored uh, to sit uh, face to face with MP Yaobian, who's done more in two years in her term in parliament than we have men in parliament who've been there for decades. Um, and she's now doing more for the opposition and for the community since the Beirut explosion than all of our ministers and members of parliament combined. So thank you. Uh, on activism and research and career, it is absolutely indivisible. Today, the world does not talk about bridging. I'll talk about as an academic. 20 years ago, we used to say researchers need to bridge practice with theory. Now, that's absolutely not the case. The doors of the university and of the profession need to be open to the community, particularly a community in disaster. They're not separate. And for many people in my gener generation, actually going for a PhD was a form of political activism because we wanted to control the narrative that was coming out from the Middle East. It's not only people in the West that come and write about our struggles. We can write about our own struggles and we can create pedagogy and activism based on our research and findings. So my PhD was an opposition uh, move as well. Because in 2009, I thought after the Syrians would leave in 2005, we're going to have a better Lebanon. We didn't. So I wanted to go and study elections and reform and the challenges. And that's continued until today. So I think our professions are uh, inadvertently linked to our activism, no matter what we do. In Lebanon in particular, even the private sector today is part of an opposition that is trying to reclaim basic rights. So, of course, as a university professor in politics, I cannot sit and, uh, and only write. And I think I think that this is also very important to really 
remind ourselves of, you know, this this typical division of roles in the society. So if you're a politician, you're a politician. If you're a journalist, you're a journalist. I don't think that, you know, there's there's one thing that you need to do as a woman in the society, which brings me to um, to my question to uh, to Paula. So you've been you've been a member in the parliament, but um, long before that, and this is from what I view and what a lot of people view, you've already been involved in the political spe- sphere through media, through journalism. You interviewed big names. So you're really you're not really new to the scene um, in terms of understanding it and, you know, diving into the details. But um, throughout this career, uh, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge facing women in politics in Lebanon and specifically women in politics? Because we honestly, we don't have a lot of women represented. So... The problem in Lebanon is uh, the the campaigning is always boy- b- based on fear mongering. Uh, it's always big questions: the existence of the Christians in this country, the uh, the sects and their rights. Uh, so it's very difficult to tell them that this is also on the agenda, and it's for it's very important to have gender balance and to have. Uh, an equal representation or a balanced representation. So to push forward the agenda of of, of the gender is not easy in a country uh, like Lebanon. Every day they're telling you about your own existence. So uh, this is one. Two, um, we still live in a patriarchal, uh, sexist, uh, third world country model in Lebanon. We have to admit that All this system is not helpful to have women in politics. And then if you have a woman who is opposing the mafia, just like I I tried to do in two years, and the smear campaigns is really, um, I mean, beyond anything uh, you can imagine. Uh, They can go so low, they can go so so mean. And and I I was telling Carmen just before we started that, I, uh, they invented a sister for me that I never had before. And people sometimes tend to believe anything they see on WhatsApp, uh, especially if the message is repeated all the time. Um, I think I'm uh, luckier than others that I have the, um, how to say, I have more uh, uh, strength to fight this fight because... I'm divorced, I'm not married, so I don't have the pressure of someone telling me, look at what they are doing to your reputation, the pressure that the family can 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 put on you. I don't have a brother. My father died. That's not a good thing, but I mean, I don't have a, a family pressure. Uh, my son is a feminist. I raised him to be a feminist, uh, and he's... Uh, He's, he's, he's with me, he loves what I'm doing, and this is for me a, a big support. My sister is the same. So I'm surrounded by a family who think like me and who think that we should fight this fight. We should not, you know, uh, just hide and, and be afraid because they try to intimidate you all the time. They try to make you feel afraid. And if you don't have also the, the, the means for your politics, you cannot do it in Lebanon. You need to, to be strong on more than, than, than a level or two to be able to fight on different levels. So um, I was also hurting the, the, the pocket of the mafia, not only the f- sec- seven, six mafiosi who are the so-called za'im or leaders of, of the clan in Lebanon. It's also the, uh, the businessman. Uh, I stopped many projects for them, the incinerators in all Lebanon. When you stop the incinerator of Beirut, it, was, it had a ripple effect everywhere. They, they wanted also to change the, the, the face of the corniche and to, to put extra layer, you know, in, in the sea. And, all of these projects that we know are only for their own interest to make more money and uh, to, you know to to go deeper in our problems not to solve anything so all these fights um you pay a very high price to fight it but it's worth fighting and i think people are waking up i can see it again in the universities i can see it in the streets i can see it everywhere we still have a much smaller um, uh, base, sectarian base, the hardcore, those who are have you know special interest and direct interest with the political caste, but this is shrinking, and what's growing 
is that movement of the people who refuse to have anything to do with the political parties, with their lies, with their propaganda, with their sectarianism. People are fed up with this. Women and men alike are fed up with this. So if I want to answer your question, being a woman in politics, it's much harder in any third world country, not only in Lebanon. But we, uh, we, we, we pretend to be diverse, different religions and different sects. They think the same. They think this, they look the same way to women, even if they're Christian, they lived all their life in, in Europe and in the West. They come back to Lebanon and they have the same approach. The male in the family is the one who inherits everything, politics and money and everything. And, and the girl is just, uh, uh, we, we love our daughter, but she will go somewhere else, join different families. So she's, so it starts in this little, uh, the noyau, you know, the, the little family, and it goes to the whole society. This is how they think. And this is how, uh, this is, we should not accept this. We should keep on telling the girls that they have the same rights, just like everyone else. And equal rights. And I'm for, for the quota. I'm a fierce fighter for the quota because I think this is the only way. They tell you that the quota is humiliating for women. No, it's not. The way things are right now are humiliating for women. Not having a quota. This is a country of quota. Is it humiliating for different sects to have the seats like this? In a country of quota, the woman quota is important because it's also rectifying a huge historical uh, uh, mistake when women were the girls were supposed to stay home learn how to cook and the boys had the full horizon in, in front of them they go study the, the the girls have less less years of, of studying and it continues in uh, different uh, uh, levels in work in everything the 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 upbringing of the boy is different than the upbringing of the girl. So the quota is also there to um, rectify the injustice towards women for years and years. Of course. So Carmen, we, we spoke a bit about the political part, what happens, you know, when you're an MP or when, uh, when you're behind the scenes, when you listen to all of these uh, challenges and when you're pushed out sometimes as a woman or pushed in because they sort of want to use you in this but you've been in the streets you've also been behind the screens and you've also been in classrooms and in other spaces having closer discussions with other policymakers, with experts with different generations so in your opinion in that field if you want from the streets all the way to the classrooms why are we lacking this representation um, in the higher Lebanese political scene specifically for women. Women are present in the media, they're activists, they're in the streets, securing protesters from being arrested. Yet again, when we talk about it from your point of view, why aren't we yet represented the way we should be? Um, I think women's representation and gender equality is the entry point to reform Lebanon's political system. It is the political change that if you do, everything else will cascade from it. Because when women get their rights and they're equally represented, it means religious courts don't have a grip over people's power. It means that capitalism doesn't only allow for certain kinds of people to have the chance to be active in civil society, so on and so forth. And it also means that there is an agenda for gender equality that's put on an agenda that's been for 100 years sectarian and patriarchal. The fight for women's representation and gender equality does not concern women only. This area of reform will change everything. We know why women are not represented. It is because the people in power have a vested, vested interest in keeping themselves and their families in power. When women are to be represented, and women not just nominal representation, it's not just by number, it's gender equality as an issue, these people will not have a power base anymore. We know why women can't win. It's because of finance. It's because of access to spaces and to people. And it's because of the social roles. And I'll give you one example around social roles. I've been speaking to hundreds of women over the years. And one woman, she told me, you know, every time a woman wants to run, they say her place is not in politics. She said, but the men cannot pick up the trash. So I don't get it. Like, why is it that every time a woman needs to run, there are all of these measures and criteria and she needs to be this and that. But look what the men t did to the country. Another important quote to keep in mind, and this cuts across generations, like from student elections in the classroom all the way up to, you know, senior judges. Women have told me this in their 50s and in their uh, teens. Um, 
where men meet and ma- make decisions is a very informal space. In Lebanon, our political parties are not political parties. They have no bylaws. They have no internal elections, no accountability. Where does their money come from? We don't have formal structures. Uh, no, MP Yaobian said, I entered a movement. We formed a list. We put an agenda. I mean, that is a formal way of competing where you, me and her can have an equal chance. There is no political competition in the country. The districts are divided by sectarian homogeneity. And also the results are known in advance. So women don't have a chance to access. Yani. I never forget this woman. Judge, you know, powerful lady in her 50s. She said, I can't even knock on the door and go talk to a man in his office and close the door behind me. And she said, men do this all the time. They meet at night, they smoke, they drink argile, they meet each other. That's where decisions happen over a list and who gets nominated. And that's how you become known to the Zaim. A woman in a party is tasked to do breakfast and brunches and marathons. And unfortunately, in sectarian political parties, women internalize this misogyny. It's the women in political parties that told me in 2018, we don't have women. We need to train them. And that is a very problematic approach, which many people have written about it. We don't need to empower women. We need to change structures. And slowly we change structures. And when structures change and there's really gender equality, the sectarian system as it stands will not rule. Because as the MP was saying, it's about coexistence, uh, the rights of the sect, A gender equality agenda has no rights of the sect, has the rights of people. So that's the fight. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and maybe one day we could see, maybe I'm being hopeful, but maybe one day we could see an all-women party. We're actually, I, I'm against women. that. We are, we are pro-participation. Mm-hmm. I don't like to see even a panel <laughs> with, with only women. We are pro-participation. And when I speak about the gender quota, it's it goes both uh, genders. You need to have... 35 to 40, or maybe 50% parity between men uh, and women. Participation is important. Having a balanced representation is important for both sides. I don't like to see lists of women only. I feel it's uh, the same way. Like I have the same feeling for this list, like the all men lists. And I think more and more, Uh, since we started this movement, and I can say we, because in 2018, we were the only list in the history of Lebanon with 33% of women on the list. And it wasn't easy, Carmen, to find women to run, especially in, in some areas. It, it was very challenging to find women and for this woman to accept to run. But we managed to have 33%. I'm sure that in 2022, we'll have more than 33% women on our list. And All the traditional, conventional parties had to follow us, so-called parties. Uh, they had to put women on their list just to look good. They had to endorse women. I know parties that had never been represented by women chose ministers, women ministers to be women and young. And this is all the effect of the movement of the brave. Sometimes people ask me, what did you achieve? They don't see how much, not myself, I mean, as a group, as Tahaluf Watani, as Taqattum, as all of us, what we have achieved already, I mean, sometimes you you cannot measure it uh, very uh, carefully. But but if you see, I mean, I can feel the change since we started in 2017, 2018, and now. No, the, the positioning of women is different. And because they have no achievements, because people don't trust them, they have to go and choose each time in every government more and more women just to to look good, to be uh, to, to show the world that they are uh, that something new is happening here. Since they cannot do reforms, they're just working on, you know, having more women. Uh, I think having women in politics is disruptive on the long run, just like Carmen was was uh, explaining. Um, I, I I don't know how exactly, but I can feel already that it can be really disruptive for all this uh, the system that we live in. I can want I just to, sorry, just of course, really yes, quickly. I just want to say it's disruptive when it is at center stage. So I agree, like not to have a women list or women. Uh, this is what political parties do: a women branch, Qatar al Mara. They yeah. do breakfast clubs. Exactly. Okay, the Hay al Wataniya, the NCLW, go do gender issues. Okay, I resigned because that's not what we need. We need women at the center stage. Okay, because all of our politics is about gender. Essentially, it's about that. In decision making, women should be in decision making. So this is why I want to ask you, uh, you took a very brave decision um, among seven other MPs to actually resign 
from uh, from the parliament after uh, after a long political battle to actually gain a seat. Yes. And what's what's triggering me is to ask you if why did you do it, and if you do it as if you did it as a form of activism, um, because I can see that you know these resignations they did leave a mark somewhere. And they did trigger a lot of discussions. So as a woman who's been represented in the parliament and whom everyone celebrated, yet you took this courageous step and you just, you resigned. So what's the story behind this? What happened in Beirut is, for me, was a turning point. We cannot continue after the blast as if nothing happened, as if it's just a, it's an accident. They will tell you it was an accident. Yes, there was some ahmel. What is ahmel? Negligence. Yeah, some negligence, but it's it's an, it's just an accident. They cannot treat this as just an accident. Uh, it's it's uh, for me it was a turning point in politics. You cannot continue with the mafia, pretending that yeah we continue. We just go to the parliament and we ask uh, uh, the speaker to uh, to have the chance to raise your voice and say something that everyone else will repeat. What's happening today is anything that we can say here, Carmen and I, you will hear all the MPs representing the parties that are in power. They will say the same. They will even go further. They will talk about corruption as if they have nothing to do with it. Everyone in power right now, they're pretending to be opposition, starting with the president, the speaker, the uh, prime minister, the ministers. Everyone is in opposition. I was listening today to an MP and a minister talking just the way we talk about the problems, about not being, uh, uh, that's not a country, the institutions. So everyone is telling his own base, it's not me, it's the blame game, it's the other. The problem is the other leader. It's not us. And this is how they're dividing the country. I felt that the only thing to do to stop this circle is someone has to resign. Even if I was alone to resign, I was willing to do it. But I was honestly expecting some other parties to feel ashamed and to resign because they know there's nothing they can do being in the parliament. And sometimes I hear right now, what about the votes? If there's a vote on what? There is no vote on anything. Berry decides from his house what law should pass and what will not pass. And he doesn't even look at the hands if are there, it's, if the hands are raised or not. He doesn't even give a damn about it. He just goes and صدق, if he wants it to pass. And that's a decision that he decides. I don't know with whom. Absolutely. It's a big circus. So it is good to, whenever there is uh, elections, we have to face the uh, establishment. We have to run against the establishment. We have to claim seats as much as possible, especially that the ballots are the voice of the people and their votes. We have to use our democracy to change things. But when we need to leave, when we need to resign, we have to be able to resign. Nobody resigns in Lebanon anymore. I mean, since Edouard Hnein, you have only few resignation with all this big failure Hardly any resignations. I know that the street and the Saura did not ask me to resign. But I felt after the explosion that it was high time to do it. I have been thinking since October 17. And I've talked to many friends in the, um, the, the Tahalouf, our partners, our friends about it. And we were really thinking, when is the good timing? After the blast. For me, it was absolutely that timing, especially that I'm in the street all the time. We started on August 5, working with the people, and I've seen how angry they were, how hurt. This is not something that will be forgotten. I know we have short memory as Lebanese. We have new problems every day. We forget, we tend to forget what happened, but the port is right there, reminding us every day of our votes, of the chosen ones that we chose, unfortunately, to represent us. I don't think this time people will forget what happened to them. And I do think that, honestly, after all of the protests that happened in Lebanon, and we've been having this discussion that if people were to go back to the streets now, but OK, protests are important, but maybe that's not the most important part right now. I think that 
we needed bold moves in Lebanon. Regardless of whether we agree with politicians or we agree with lawmakers, bold moves really move the society sometimes and really trigger a lot of questions. And I think that we're not used to this. As you were saying, we're not used to to people just leaving something that, um, that they got or something that they gained. And people did not leave the streets easily, um, Carmen, in 2019. They tried to stay. They were pushed back a lot. And then women were pushed to the front or pushed themselves to the front. And this is what I want to try and explore with you because women really ended up in the front. And this was, we've always been in the front in Lebanon, fighting for our rights, demanding for change. But in 2019, it was different. So they were protecting men. They were. How, protecting men. I mean, yeah. How was this? How was this experience? And what did it change in your opinion? I think that the Lebanese system hurts its women the most. So that's why women have the most to lose or to gain from the revolution. That's why they were willing to fight with their bodies, with their time, with their knowledge, with their expertise, with their families, with their food. Like, no, women, knew, we knew if this revolution is fixed and we have a change in politics towards greater representation, we are we can win the most from this as women historically oppressed. But women also had, we had the biggest uh, loss out of the revolution. We knew that if the revolution was crushed, we would stand to lose the most. And the subsequent months, the economic crisis, both fiscal and economic jobs, corona and the explosion, women have lost more than men in this country and everything. Increase in violence against women in the household, more care economy. We have more women unemployed than ever. Refugee women, migrant women were thrown at the streets. So we knew. So we were at the forefront, not because of this romanticization. You know, some Western journalists, oh, look, Arab women, they're on the forefront. No, it's because every daughter and mother and, and classmate of mine, all of us looked at each other and said, yes, we need to be on the streets because we have been shut up for so long, oppressed, beaten up, raped. And we had to lose the most because the revolution was crushed very violently. However, I just want to challenge this linearity of revolt and protest. You know, people protesting since the time of kings, people go on the street and ask the king to give them favors. That If the king is unbending, we have to find other modes of resistance. The MP resigned, but she resigned in protest and she went the next day to Dafa campaign. And Dafa campaign, the space, the model, the trust she is building is a way to resist by creating an alternative that is green, that is inclusive. That's what me and many others have taken it upon ourselves after August 5, is to stop thinking this linearity. Yes, electoral politics is one way to steal power, both for women and independent men as well. But it's not the only way. We have two years of complete devastation, depression. Today, the World Bank says we are in a deliberative depression with increased poverty. There has to be another way. So for me, women lead on the streets normal because they're the most hurt. But when there is crisis, they also create modes of resistance. And this is what we look, what we can also learn from other communities, co-creation. Okay, create the alternative. It's not just demand the alternative. Let's create spaces that are inclusive and green and fair. Let's take over the health system. You know, our primary healthcare centers are managed by political parties. Vote buying doesn't happen on the day of the election. It happens decades before how you get a job, where you get your medicine, if your kid gets a visa, right? It's it's a whole system. So let's create an alternate system that is welcome and inclusive for everybody and fight the fight between now and then. So I don't look at... I look at the devastation of the explosion as a moral obligation. You asked me about my job. Honestly, who cares? Today, we are all going to die. We have to find a way to align the civic resistance with our jobs. And I think that this is the next the agenda for the next two years. And if we come out of this with our dignity, we will fight in an election, of course. I have I have this, you know, this looming questions in my in my head um, because I think that, you know, the three of us are vocal and on different levels and you know we we work in different sectors but we do try to fight this fight and we do try you know to raise our voice but do we think that women in Lebanon are maybe forced into choosing different priorities and thus they are afraid to fight the fight politically afraid of of having to run you know towards politics and of having to um to bear with the consequences uh you're a mother but but I don't want but I don't want to focus on the fact that, you know, the typical fact that you're a mother. How do you balance and all of that? It's not about that, but it's about 
the fact that we're afraid, are we afraid as women to actually, you know, run towards politics in this country? There is one common denominator in Lebanon, and it's uh, the anxiety. And uh, everyone is afraid, men and women alike. Uh, but being a woman is also, I mean, a bigger burden. That's that's for sure. Um, men are looking how to uh, travel somewhere to see how they can provide for their families. And most of the time, it's the woman trying to provide and trying to keep some balance in, in, in the house. And in the same time, also thinking about, you know, how things can change for all of us, for their, for their, uh, for their kids, for their families, for their life. So being in the, uh, in the opposition today is a self-defense movement. It's not a, it's not a choice anymore. And it's really a luxury that we cannot afford to say we don't have to do anything with politics. No, we have to do with politics because politics is ruining our life. Women and men alike, they have to, um, they have to in, in endorse every opposition movement, real opposition movement. They have to change their mindset. Uh, for so long, they voted for the same political caste. They need to give a chance to someone else to do a better job. And uh, I think for once I have hope that uh, people are awakening. Uh, and this is something also a big achievement for October 17. I can tell you about my son who's a teenager. He didn't want to hear about politics before. He didn't, hear, he didn't want to hear about politics in Lebanon, especially what the new generation does not understand sectarianism. They did not live the war they don't have hatred. It's a different generation. Even those who go to the school of the Zaim and the, and the school that says the other is kafir, the other is bad, the other is... Even these kids, they have smartphones. They connect with each other. They, they have different games than ours. They have different social life. They're more exposed to everything and anything. That's why this is a different generation that this political caste also do, do not understand. I think they're in awe now, looking at the elections in the, in, the, in the universities, and they cannot understand that this is not a moment. This is not a momentum. This is ongoing. It's going to continue. So um, I have high hopes in the new generation and in women. But, uh, I mean, you, we need to keep on working more and more on the tawai. Uh, this is for me very important. Awareness, awareness is key, and it's uh, it is the biggest support that we can bring to our community. Let them know that their voices can make a difference, and that they can they can win if they go to the ballots. Uh, very challenging time is ahead of us, but we have to be you know up to the to the level of the challenges we have to stay in our country and to fight for this country for once we have hope for once there's an opening because people are changing um it's it's a common question for you both but i'm going to start with carmen because you have your careers combined at a certain point but they're also a bit different so do you remember a specific moment where you felt challenged because of your gender as a woman, where maybe you were not given an opportunity bluntly, maybe you were pushed to the side of the street uh, effectively while you were doing something, maybe you were uh, you were um, spoken to in um, yeah, in, in a patriarch patriarchal way, or um, or maybe you felt some hate towards you because you're a woman. Did you ever experience this? And you know, can you tell us a little about it? I think you know every day as as women living in Lebanon, not only Lebanese women walking on the street, you feel at risk. I mean, it bothers me so much. I think all the time I have two younger sisters and I have many many students, and I feel their life is at risk. Okay, you know, they it might it might not happen to them, but the fact that it could happen to them in this country and living with these politicians is like living with a rapist because they bombed the city and now we have to live with their pictures. So it's every day, but um, but I do want to say a moment where I think it is redundant in, in our lives. You know, I feel because my politics is about hope and struggle and 
and people's livelihoods compared to what men talk about, what the MP was saying, coexistence and foreign policy that I'm ridiculed because I talk about health, environment, education, gender equality, that's not, that, that, that is not real politics. But you know, the men in power are mistaken because that's the future. Today, science, evidence, equality, especially after the pandemic, have the com- become the future of politics. And that's where the men are incompetent. They don't know how to talk about livelihoods. They simply don't. So where my ridicule now and all of us, one day this will become our strength. Lebanon's problems is not going to be solved by coexistence or za'im or foreign relations that doesn't do anything. They don't know how to do electricity, garbage, science, pandemic, vaccine, gender. They don't know to do any of that. And you know what? The women do. I hear here I want to just uh, have a little difference with with Carmen that I love and that I uh, I'm a big fan of her but I want to say that uh, I don't agree with you they don't know how to do it I'm sure they know how to do it it's uh, just because they're making a lot of money in not doing it anyone right now can get electricity to anywhere it's so easy uh, uh, women and men can do it very easily it's just there's no will Because reform comes, reform in Lebanon comes at their expense. Um, uh, they are have they are gaining a lot because the country is uh, that corrupt. This is why they can just you know put more and more people in the public sector with no uh, accountability. They can uh, keep on making money out of the fuel the fuel that we buy that is a very bad quality of fuel uh, having no electricity also is generating money for them from the barges from the mafia of, of generators in the street you have 8,000 generator only in Beirut 8,000 generator in Beirut this is killing us if this is not politics what is politics people here I, I, I totally agree with Carmen pollution is a political problem in this country because it comes from their corruption And for and pollution is killing people more than anything else, much more than Israel, much more than uh, anything else we do. So, no, our uh, our topics, let's say, uh, are highly political, and we are still fighting for our basic rights. Not even basic rights. It's just, I mean, who who is fighting in the world now to have electricity and clean water and 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 a clean environment? It's It's a global fight that the whole world is fighting, but we are fighting our own uh, uh, representatives. We are fighting our own families to have a country where you can breathe. They, we can, you cannot breathe when you live in Lebanon. You will smell something bad, you will get something bad, and you can get sick and die because of this political caste. We have the highest cancer so, rates in all of West Asia. We have the highest... Uh, metastase under 40 in uh, the whole world, everywhere in the world. And Pfizer gave a lot of money for an NGO that I know about. I'm, see, I'm part of it because they wanted to know why Lebanon has the highest metastatic, we say, metastatic rate under 40. This is scary. And it's not our DNA that are know. doing this. It they is, know that we have this. This is this it's public not genetic. Knowledge. Sometimes it's genetic. In some places, it's genetic. In Lebanon, it is not genetic. It is because of the pollution and because of the garbage uh, and the the hazardous garbage that they brought into this country that is already in our water. So what they did for us is uh, is beyond crime. They are criminals, and they're all men. <laughs> Which brings me back to repeat my question because I'm very interested also in uh, in listening to your point of view. A challenge or a moment where you felt that you were actually challenged because of your gender, because you're a woman. Um, it could go from someone asking you not to speak at this moment all the way to pushing you aside maybe politically. Yeah, it's uh, it happened all the time uh, in the parliament. I mean, you would expect that uh, 
they are representing people, they should be a little bit refined or no, <laughs> they're not at all. Not all of them. There's great people. They're very respectful. And you have also those who will every day wait for you what you're wearing and your hair today is doesn't look good and stuff like this that you would never say for a man. No matter how his hair is, he has hair or he doesn't have hair, it's not important. They expect from a woman to be every day looking good and uh, uh, dressed up. And I don't have time to think what I'm going to dress up today. I just grab whatever I find and I just go. I got. I used to go to the apartment without doing my hair a lot of time. And you have to see. You have to listen to the uh, criticism. I mean, uh, it is. It is. We need a lot of time to convince you know the whole community, the whole society that a man and woman are equal and they. Uh, they're just the same thing. There's no difference. It, it's going to take a lot of time. You have also the unconscious bias for, for men in politics. So they look at the woman like, you know, uh, they treat you like a flower. I'm not a flower. Not at all. I mean, <laughs> I can be also mean. And I used to reply really very, very harsh on, on sexist uh, remarks and, and statements, especially when I know that someone is... Uh, uh, has bad intentions already and are trying to demean me or trying to... Uh, I got a lot of that, a lot, more than you can imagine. Well, <laughs> you I can see Twitter and you can you can imagine... Look at, at my, my uh, I think uh, replies it, on Twitter and you can see... Uh, I think that it, became, it sadly became um, sort of a shared experience on social media, but not in real life between... Uh, between a lot of women who are active and who just... I mean, you do... both have been heroic in the last months in particular. <laughs> really, it's a lot. It's, it's, uh, uh, and you, it's gendered. It's gendered and it's, it's, it's violent. Gendered. It's very violent. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you say that the mafia is good and this party is an excellent party and, uh, you know, it happened with Luna, it happens, oh, it will happen with you all the time. <laughs> I mean, they can... You're an icon. You're excellent. You're the best. And if you say that you are a mafia, you are stealing this country, you are doing this and that, they will answer back very easily. You're a prostitute. And that's it. Sad, ha nothing, sad but sad nothing but to true. do. Nothing to do with what you're saying. Nothing to do with the... This is the way they defend themselves. And this tells you a lot about their behavior. And it's top political leadership. You know, in Arabic, we say these are Wujah Sahara. Yeah. These are supposed to be your MPs, like, your ministers. Like the top of the, yeah, top these of are the, the good guy. I mean, this is who they choose to become minister and MP. I mean, it's yeah. this, this is this is their top guys. I mean, this is the best they can do. Yeah. Well, it's it's an it's a never ending conversation because it's inspiring on both sides. And I do know that many of us in Lebanon disagree politically on so many details and have so many different, um, you know, social standards and social norms. But I do also think that it's important to always listen to one another, which is what we're all trying to do. We're trying to listen. We're trying to ask, why did you do this and why did it happen? Um, because without these, no one will have fair answers, in my opinion. So I really want to thank you both for all for your honesty first, for taking the time to do this and for the insightful talk, because I am sure that um, many women will actually listen to this and it will resonate at a certain moment for them. So thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Rona. Thank you for listening to our first podcast organized by the Friedrich Norman Foundation for Freedom as part of its Female Forward International Campaign. Our next podcast will tackle women in the business. So tune in and keep an eye on FNF's social media pages.